My name is Justin Carlson, and in this segment, I want to talk to you about devices and cardiac devices, specifically to try to give a little bit of clarity because sometimes these can seem uh, very daunting to us in the emergency department to say, how do I manage this? What do I do? Where do I go from here? And hopefully over the next few slides as we talk through these cardiac devices, you have a little bit more comfort with managing patients with them and better understand some of the nuances around them. I've not received any financial conflicts of interest for this. I have no commercial interests uh, with this talk or with any of the devices that are going to be mentioned here. So from an overview standpoint, I want to talk first about pacemakers and AICDs and then change into LVADs or left ventricular assist devices. So first, starting with pacemakers and AICDs, let's take an actual case and use this to help understand how we might manage patients with AICDs and pacemakers. So this is an actual case. This is a 71-year-old male who came in because his AICD fired. He felt a little lightheaded earlier in the day. Uh, he was somewhat diaphoretic, but otherwise felt, felt well. And he had the AICD placed about a month ago for, uh, actually for electrical storm, recurrent ventricular tachycardia. His past medical history was significant for hypertension, CHF, and recurrent ventricular tachycardia. Smokes, uh, he's allergic to enalapril, um, and really the rest of his history is pretty unremarkable. His physical exam, everything looks normal, all his vital signs look good, he really looks very good. So what are we going to do for this patient who has an AICD, we know that he has it for ventricular tachycardia, it went off once. What do we do? What's the workup for him? So the summary, right? He had it placed for that. He presented with a little bit of lightheadedness, but now feels great, no symptoms. What are we going to do? So we should look at a workup that includes a CBC, a basic metabolic panel, some cardiac biomarkers, troponin specifically, a chest X-ray, EKG, and interrogation of the device. And this is where it can sometimes get a little bit, a uh, little bit cloudy about how we do that, where we go from there. So let's talk through that. So with these, most folks, most patients will have a card that actually gives information about what they have as far as a device. And we'll talk through why that's important here in just a minute. So we'll get an EKG on this patient. They present with lightheadedness. They have a history of an AICD. And we'll talk about a few things to look at on that. And I really would encourage you to uh, go back to Dr. Matu's talk about interpreting ECGs to really get some of the nuance we won't go into all that here, but we will talk about some of the key features, especially in the setting of an AICD and pacemaker that may be malfunctioning. Chest X-ray. So one of the things that's really important is to make sure that the leads for the pacemaker are appropriate, that they're continuous, there's not any fracture in those leads. And really what we're looking for is different components. So we have the pacemaker that has the pulse generator piece. That's the battery, usually lasts about 10 years. And that's in a pocket, usually over the left chest. The leads then go in through the subclavian and, excuse me, subclavian and down to wherever the device inserts, or wherever the leads land. And that can be different depending on the type of, uh, the type of device that we're looking at. I'll go into that more in just a few minutes here. So in this patient, we look at it, the leads look good. We don't see any breaks or fractures or dislodgement in them. One of the things that patients with pacemakers can get, it's an infrequent uh, complication, but something called twiddler syndrome, where the patient can actually play with the device to the point that they curl up the leads around the actual device itself. And so instead of the leads being in the heart, can actually be around the device and can be then stimulating those muscles instead of the myocardium. This is where sometimes folks get a little bit confused and that's the actual terminology around pacemakers. There's a significant number of letters and what they mean in different positions in different order. There's many of them. But for us in the emergency department, I think it's important for us to focus on the first three. And that is, a, there's going to be a letter in the first position, the second position, and the third position. Let's focus in on those three. The first position is what does the pacemaker actually pace? The lead, where is it? What does it pace? So it can be the atrium, the ventricle, or both. That's designated with a D. The second position is what does it sense? Again, is that the atrium, the ventricle, or does it sense both? Is it dual? And finally, what does it do with that information? Does it not do anything with it? 
Is it triggered by the information that it gets from the lead? Is it inhibited? Or can it be both triggered and inhibited? And let's look at just a couple of examples of that, right? So again, those three, if we focus in on those, that'll tell us what's paced. Is it atrioventricle? Most are going to be dual chamber. And so here's an example, AOO. What this means, the atria is paced, there's no sensing function, and it doesn't do any response. It's not in, in, uh, inhibited or triggered by any other part. How about this example? Well, this paces the ventricle, senses the ventricle, and is inhibited if there's spontaneous ventricle ac ventricular activity. Two more. VAT. How about this? This one paces the ventricle, senses the atria, and is triggered by the atria, triggered by where it gets a sensing from. Last one. And this is, this is going to be a fairly common DDD. And what this means is it dual paces, dual senses, and is, can be both triggered or inhibited based on what, what it gets, what information is coming in. So when we're interrogating one of these devices, what's really important to know is who's the manufacturer, because that can change a little bit of how you do it, the AICD with the nomenclature, and why was it put in. So for our case, our patient that we mentioned at the beginning of this, our 71-year-old male had it placed because of recurrent ventricular tachycardia, because of VT storm. We also want to know what happened during the event. Was, it, was the shock that was delivered, was that appropriate or inappropriate? And we'll talk about that in just a minute here. The reason that's important is because these can malfunction. We can have problems with any part of this. We can have a failure of the device to sense. We can have a failure of the device to pace or put an output. We can have a situation where it's putting output but just doesn't capture. And then we can have issues where it's not uh, sending out the appropriate amount and can actually have tachycardia along with it. And a lot of this can be interpreted by the 12 lead, by the ECG. This is one of these examples. This is a failure to sense. So here we see pacer spikes that are happening in this, but it doesn't necessarily sense that there's an underlying rhythm. That can happen because of a number of different conditions. It really fails to detect the native rhythm properly. And so you'll see spikes. The challenge with this though is if it's not sensing, you can uh, result in an R on T phenomenon, which can cause ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. The causes for this can be many, but can be related to lead dislodgement. It can also happen with myocardial infarction or some antidysrhythmics. And the treatment is really guided towards the underlying cause. Sometimes you may even need temporary pacing to correct this. Sometimes you'll have failure to pace, and this can happen as a result of a number of different things. This can happen when there's output failure. So the pacemaker may not be delivering the stimulus to the heart, and those patients will come in with hypoperfusion. Again, as shown on the ECG before. This really can happen when there's, and, and this, when we see it, there's going to be a lack of pacer spikes, right? So there's not the output that we would want. In these situations, that can happen as a result of lead dislodgement or fractures. It can also happen if it is oversensing. So it's interpreting other things as myocardial contraction. And in those situations, we may need to treat with a magnet. Sometimes there's also going to be a failure to capture and a failure to pace. So in these situations, this may be where the pacemaker, in a failure to capture, the pacemaker may deliver, so we'll see the spike, but there's no capture. The myocardium itself doesn't actually depolarize. And in those situations, that again could be from lead dislodgement, so we may see the spike, but if it's not in the right spot, not stimulating the myocardium, that may not lead to contraction of the myocardium. There may be an issue with a battery, and there may not be enough uh, enough electricity to actually depolarize the myocardium. What also though can happen is there could be issues with elevated pacing thresholds. So acute myocardial infarction, electrolyte disturbances can also lead to this. Certain medications and even if they're in profound acidosis that can lead to failure to capture. So identifying those underlying causes is really key. Shifting now to one of the other devices that is the LVAD or left ventricular assist device. 
LVADs can be, be placed for a number of different reasons, but I want you to think of them as a bridge. While some patients may be on them more long term, oftentimes these can be a bridge until patients either recover from a disease process, that could be myocarditis or could be an MI awaiting for a pacemaker, uh, but these are oftentimes a bridge to get to a point where they can get some more definitive treatment or recover from their disease process. These can be really scary to us, but I want to put out there that there are a number of resources available. There have been multiple different uh, left ventricular assist devices over the years. Some of those are listed here. Those continually change, and there are different devices on the market now relative to several years ago, and there will be different ones likely in the future. Rather than trying to remember the nuance of each of these different devices and how they change over time, I'll provide you with a resource in just a few slides to be able to help with that. First though, just stepping back, what is an LVAD? What is a left ventricular assist device? And this is a device that really helps the heart that is not able to really provide a perfusing amount uh, of contraction on its own. This provides that extra assist. And so what it does is it actually sits in the left ventricle, takes blood flow out from there, pumps it, and then puts it back into the atrium. Excuse me, puts it back into the aorta. And that provides that additional support, that circulatory support, to allow patients perfusion. There's several different parts to it. There's a battery pack, there's a pump, uh, and depending on the type of device, there's actually two different ones. One is a compression type. That's much less common now. In fact, the ones that are commercially available predominantly are these rotary types, where it's almost like a little propeller that's inside that provides continuous flow through the LVAD. As a result, that circulatory, that little propeller that's pushing it through, both helps, but also can lead to some issues, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. So you have a patient who comes in with an LVAD, now what? Well first, you got this. You can take care of them the same way you take care of any other patient. Do your history and physical exam as usual. They may very well need an ECG. You likely need to identify what device they have, get vital signs as you normally would with one exception, and that's blood pressure. We'll talk about that. The last thing though is call for help. Patients with LVADs have coordinators. They have individuals who are available to help talk through any issues that you might be having. So if the pump's beeping, if something's alarming on it, call. They have a coordinator who's available who can talk you through those steps. Before you do that though, make sure you have their vital signs. And one of the key elements, one of the key differences in a patient with a left ventricular assist device is how to get a blood pressure. Because they have that rotary type, uh, propeller type pump, they're not going to have a blood pressure that has a systolic and a diastolic. They will have a continuous pressure. So to get that, if you blow up a blood pressure cuff and try to listen for carot cough sounds, try to listen for those sounds, you won't hear them. So instead, you want to put up a blood pressure cuff and listen with a Doppler. You'll get one sound. That's going to be the pressure that they're getting throughout their circulatory system. Goal is 65 to 80, but have that pressure when you talk with their coordinator if there's questions about what the pump, uh, what the alarm might be going off. There are several different things that can happen as a result of complications of LVADs. Bleeding, certainly these patients are anticoagulated. They can develop in-pump thrombosis and may require additional treatment for that. They do have a device uh, that can certainly get infected. They can have underlying malignant dysrhythmias. So remembering the reason that they had the LVAD placed in the, first, uh, in the first place, that may be related to underlying cardiomyopathy or some other issue, and so they can have dysrhythmias with that. The other thing is with their low flow state, the thought is that with this kind of continuous pressure of, say, a, a map of, excuse me, not a map, but a pressure of 65 or 70, that they're at risk of GI malformations and so can bleed from that. The last thing, and back to the bleeding, is with this propeller type pump in there, that actually chops up a lot of the uh, factors. And so as a result, they are functionally decreased on their von Willebrand factor, so that also puts them at risk of bleeding. The question that always comes up with, with left ventricular assist devices is can we, do cardiac, can we do CPR or not if they're in cardiac arrest? 
And here is a table with each of these different devices that have been out there over the years. Can you do CPR? Can you not? Um, a lot of the books will say, well, some of them you can, some of them you can't. Here's the truth of it. There is almost no chance of getting them back if you don't do CPR. And there is actually a case study that was published in the last couple of years of several patients who presented with a left ventricular assist device in. They were able to successfully do CPR in many of those cases and had ROSC in some of them. Now, that doesn't, that's not high quality evidence to say absolutely this is what we all should be doing. But if you don't do cardiac, if you don't do CPR, they're almost certainly going to die. And so this chart may help to better identify some patients who you may make that decision to do CPR in. Now, I showed that here, and each of those bits of data come from a site called mylvad.com. I don't have any relationship with them. I just find it a very valuable resource to be able to go to, mylvad.com. And under the EMS resources, they have a really nice outline of what the different LVADs are that are out there, what to do as far as anticoagulation for them, and what to do as far as CPR and in the setting of cardiac arrest. So because we will see these infrequently, and you may need a resource to go to right at that moment, mylvad.com has been very valuable for me when I kind of manage these patients in the emergency department. So in summary, AICDs, they're not as scary as they seem. Again, the first three parts will tell you exactly what the AICD, what it does. So does it pace, what's sensed, and what the response is. And for LVADs, lots of questions about them. There's lots of help out there. Make sure to check the blood pressure via, a, uh, via Doppler. And then if there are questions about what to be done in the setting of cardiac arrest, mylvad.com has a very simple chart to help walk through that.